Hallelujah, God. We just want to worship you in this place tonight, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus.
this evening sing how deep how deep how deep and how deep and how wide how wide how wide how wide how wide how great how great is your love for me come on sing it one more time how deep how deep and how
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I admit that. How many of you, how many of you realize that you're walking and talking, leaning and sleeping on the grace of God? Hallelujah. Keep on knocking. It's always a continuous action command. So if you need healing, okay, look around, see who has their hands up. Doesn't matter if this is your church home or not. As long as you're a believer, the Bible says these signs follow them that believe in my name. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Praise God. I see a brother back here in the back. Okay, needs hands laid on him. Okay, now maybe you need some other kind of a miracle. Quickly, put your hand up. Some other kind of a miracle. <laughs> Okay, look for anyone who has their hands up. <clears throat> praise God. Pastor Mike's going to lead us in prayer tonight. But let's all begin to praise the Lord. Praise God. 
Father, we are thankful for your love and your grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You're worthy of praise and honor and glory and power and majesty. You're the God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mighty Lord Jesus, we praise and glorify that name above every name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Lord, we accept tonight, God, your work of righteousness for us on the cross of Calvary. And because of that work of righteousness, we know we can ask and we have what we ask for, God. We come boldly into the throne room of God and we ask for miracles. We ask for signs. We ask for wonders. We ask for a mighty move of God in each one of us concerning our health and our well-being, God. We ask for cancer to be destroyed. We ask for diabetes to go back where it came from. We ask for pains and hurts from arthritis to be destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask for loved ones to be healed and set free by the glory and the majesty of God, Father. We thank you. Every single thing that is good and right is coming to us tonight, God, by faith. We receive it, Lord. We receive your healing power. We receive your power and strength. We receive everything from your hand tonight, God. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the majesty we give to you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. God. Turn around and greet four or five people. Let them know God loves them. Thank the praise team, the musicians tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Mighty Lord Jesus. Praise God. If you need a debit envelope, our other ushers have debit envelopes if you need one. And if you want to help on the trip to Burma, there will be a basket on the table back there on the way out in case you want to help on that mission trip to Burma. And we'll be saying more about it in the weeks to come. Still got about nine weeks yet. So, well, we have several announcements to call to your attention. Number one, uh, ladies of Sheffield, you're invited to a new Sunday school class, The Princess Within, The Restoration of the Soul of a Woman. Starts April 19th at 9 o'clock a.m. in Koinonia A. Allow Jesus to restore your soul through this awesome study of the book by Sarita Jakes. Call Pat at the church to sign up and if you want the book. Men's Ministry is having a picnic at Coleman Park in Raytown, Saturday, April 25th at 11 o'clock. Again, you can call Pat at the church for more information. This Friday is the Shift Young Adults Baptism Night. Come witness 10 young adults. <laughs> Come witness 10 young adults publicly confessing their faith by being water baptized. And that's in the Gene Westlake Chapel at 7.30 p.m., reception to follow. The next all-church water baptism is Sunday, April the 26th, following the 11 o'clock service. And again, if you've been saved and haven't followed the Lord in an act of baptism, baptism doesn't save you. You know, Peter makes it clear in his letter, in his letter that baptism does not wash away the filth of the flesh. But it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. In other words, you're being obedient to what God told you to do. And uh, baptism doesn't cleanse anybody. I was, uh, they tell me I was baptized when I was a baby, but after I got saved, I got really baptized. And uh, no one in the Bible is baptized until after they receive Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of, lot of, a lot of churchianity around that you're saved when, when you're dipped in the water. If you don't know Jesus, all you do is go down a dry center and come up a wet one. Amen. 
because it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from sin, the Word of God declares. And again, the Bible says, he that has the Son has what? Life. And he that doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. And as I say all over the world anymore, religions like the flu shot stops you from getting the real thing. I think one of my favorite passages in the original of the New Testament, the Greek text, is where Paul's comparing his religious credentials. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, the Hebrews, boy, I had religious credentials with personally knowing Jesus Christ. And one of the greatest scholars in the history of the world starts a sentence trying to explain the difference, but therefore, indeed, at least even. That doesn't make sense in any language in the history of the world. But therefore, indeed, at least lost for words. You know how I translate, but therefore, indeed, at least even? Wow. That's what happens when you meet Jesus Christ. I was religious till I was 19, but that night in Detroit, he changed my life when I was 19, when I met Jesus Christ. You have all the religious credentials in the world, but they don't save anybody. They don't save anybody at all. It's knowing him. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And it doesn't matter where you've been. When you know him, the past is gone. Praise God. And then Randy and Elizabeth have some baskets out in the lobby to help with their prison ministry. You read the glowing reports. They, uh, they send me a report or a long one or two or three or five or six every day and let me know what's going on in the prisons all over America. They get in death row. They get in places where most, uh, where most prison ministries can't go. They see prisoners saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they were at a banquet the other night when some of the ex-prisoners came in and they were out in the business world now telling how God had changed their lives because Randy and Elizabeth came to the prison and had revival. And we have a big part in that. We regularly support them, but they have these extra things out there to help. And it helps our ministry after the service, so they're out there, so take advantage of that. And remember to pray for them because God really anoints them and blesses them and and it's just amazing the places they go. I went on one crusade with them, and I just stood back and said, wow. But you know, it's interesting. When the prisoners heard that George Westlake was preaching, we had quite a few out. But when they heard that Elizabeth Devonport was preaching and Randy was singing, the place was packed. They've got that kind of a reputation in prisons. And so let me encourage you to help and to pray for them and believe God to give them strength. The enemy fights them. The enemy fights him like he does anybody's doing anything. I got news for you, sir. If you're serving God, the enemy's going to fight you. He knows his time is short. He's going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and you're target number one. So don't forget that. Father, we're thankful again tonight. We have the opportunity of giving back to you a portion of that that's yours. Your word tells us the first tenth belongs to you. That's not ours to decide what to do with, and anything we give beyond that is offerings. And your word plainly teaches, if we're not faithful with our finances, in Luke 16, you can't give us the true spiritual riches. I pray you bless your people abundantly as we offer these gifts out of hearts of love. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now, tonight we're going to be in the chart that's on the back of the 10 reasons why the church isn't going through the tribulation. Okay, the 10 reasons sheet why the church isn't going through the tribulation. And just by way of review, because... Uh, is anyone here for the first week in this course? It's your first time here. Well, I'll be sure and get all the handouts uh, in the back there. Uh, we started out pointing out the name of the book is the Revelation of Jesus Christ, and there's 26 pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation, and we have a list there. Okay, we have a list. Uh, and on the back of that, we have an outline of Romans 9, 10, and 11 that shows God's not finished with Israel as a group of people. Now if, an Israel, now, if a Jew gets saved today, he's part of the church. But Israel as a people are going to have the blinders taken off their eyes. And then I've give, and you have a copy of the outline that Jesus himself gives for the book of Revelation. In chapter 1, verse 19, John is told to write the things that you have seen. That's the vision of chapter 1. Secondly, write the things that are, the letters to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, and thirdly, write the things that will take place after these things. And I gave you the Greek phrase, meta tauta, after these things. And John 4, 1 starts out, after these things. After these things, the door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, and that was the voice of chapter 1 saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, was speaking, saying, come up here, and I'll show you the things that is necessary to take place after these things. After what things? After Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. 
And then you find the church in heaven in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And the great tribulation begins in Revelation 6, 1 with the appearance of the man of sin. Uh, you have the seven beatitudes of Revelation. We didn't discuss those. I just wrote them out. Then we talked about the letters to the seven churches that they're not just a statement, but they are a prophecy. We're told the book is a prophecy. And there was a situation in each, in each of these churches that showed what the church was going to be from the time it was established on the day of Pentecost till Jesus comes back for his church and on into the tribulation. So, so, so you have that list on the back of this sheet. And then we also have the story of the 77s of Daniel, where it makes it clear there's a seven-year period left in Israel's history in which God is going to accomplish the six things recorded in Daniel chapter 9. And that seven-year period, according to Daniel 9, is what's known as the Great Tribulation or the Day of the Lord in the book of Revelation. And then on the back of that, we have the seven major periods of persecution under Roman, and that refers to the church at Smyrna. Uh, uh, we have the outline of Matthew 24 and 25, the three questions that they asked Jesus. And then you have the sheep, the church, and the tribulation, why the church will not be here during the great tribulation period. And then on the back of that, I believe you have the chart that we're dealing with to start tonight. Last week we talked about the, about the 144,000 of Israel that were sealed. We talked about our kinsman redeemer and the name of the world ruler that you know as the Antichrist. And we talked about all of those names in the last couple of weeks. All those sheets are back there if you didn't get one. But tonight, I just want to look simply at this chart. I just want to look simply at the chart, so I hope you have one in your hand or you can see up there. And actually, this screen is brighter over here. Uh, there is a seven-year period left. We went through all the reasons why the church will not be here. I'll be glad to review them in another couple of weeks. But the promise of the church at Philadelphia, because you've kept the word of my endurance, I will keep you out of that hour of testing, which shall come to test all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. And if God keeps you out of something, you're not in it. He uses the same phrase in the high prayer of Jesus. He says, don't, I know at that time, don't take them out of the world. The Greek verb is iro, don't take them out of the world, but keep them out of the evil. And the Greek phrase, keep them out of the evil, is tereo ek. Now he says here, because you've kept the word of my endurance, I will tereo ek you out of that hour of testing, which shall come to test all them that dwell on the face of the earth. He doesn't say I'm keeping you out of the difficulty. He says I'm keeping you out of the time. I'm keeping you out of that hour. And in Revelation 4 and 5, the church is in heaven. And just to mention a couple other things, you cannot find the word church in the book of Revelation after chapter 3. In chapter 4 and 5, the church is in heaven. You've redeemed us by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation, made us under a God, kings, and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. And you cannot find the word church till the story is ended in Revelation 22, and then there's a warning for the church to be ready. Uh, it's interesting, my good friends that say we're going through the tribulation, and I have a whole lot of them. Uh, when I teach around the world, I meet every kind of doctrine, and I get every kind of answer on term papers, which are about that thick at master's level. And, and actually, Brother John O'Brien in the church helps me grade them. He does the preliminary grading, and right now I'm wading through them. But some of the statements that they make, it's obvious they're not, they don't believe what the Scripture says. Most of those that say the church is going to be here through the Great Tribulation take the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel to be the church. And my question, which tribe are you in? All right? It's one of the plainest statements in the entire Word of God. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel, and he names the tribes. So the 144,000 are not the church. Again, it's one of the plainest statements in Scripture. I mean, you're reading Scripture when the obvious sense makes the best sense. Any other sense is nonsense. nonsense. You have to take what it says. You don't read into it. You read out of it. And my good, and I have one paper at home now that I'm grading where he quotes so and so and so and so and so and so, and they're all saying the same thing. The 144,000 represent the church. The 144,000 are the church. The 144,000 are Israel and the church. That's not what it says. It says 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So we have to believe what it says, not what we'd like it to say. But there's a whole bunch of other things. Let me remind you that Paul outlined the order of events in 1 Thessalonians 4. Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And what's the shout? Come up here, Revelation 4.1. 1. 
with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. You're going to read where Michael the archangel comes on the scene to fight for Israel in Revelation 12 and Daniel 12. Uh, You're also going to see that Israel is standing on Mount Zion when all of this is over. And he's talking about physical Israel that finally accepts Jesus Christ. But he spelled it out. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The trumpet of God is not one of the seven trumpets. Those are the trumpets of angels. Uh, The first trumpet of God, according to Hebrews, and, and also the book of Exodus, sounded at Mount Sinai. That assembled Israel as the people of God. The last trumpet... Uh, last trumpet will reassemble Israel. As I've been telling you for 42 years that I've been here, in the Old Testament, Israel is God's exhibit A. Today, the church is exhibit A. Israel is exhibit B. When the church is gone, Israel will again be exhibit A. And Isaiah 27 indicates that great trumpet will be blown to reassemble Israel. That's the primary reason it's going. And then, so he outlined the outline. And then he indicates the day of the Lord will come after that as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord, that's the great tribulation period. The day of the Lord always refers to judgment. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, when you read 2 Thessalonians, uh, there were a whole bunch of people, they say, well, we're being persecuted, it must be the great tribulation. It must be the day of the Lord. Now, why would anyone say that? Well, the people in the, a lot of the people in the Middle East are saying that. They think they're in the great tribulation. The church has always endured tribulation and persecution. The great tribulation is the time of the judgment of God. And the Bible makes that very clear. So when it says the great day of his wrath has come, it's because of what's been going on. They finally recognize that that is the day of God's wrath. We saw that in Revelation 6. So they were saying this this must be the day of the Lord. So from what Paul had said, they'd missed the catching away, the rapture, the Greek word, the parousia. And someone had even sent them a letter and signed Paul's name to it, said this is the day of the Lord. That meant to them they'd missed the parousia, the rapture, the catching away. So Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians 2. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the parousia, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you stop being shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by a letter supposedly from us, that the day of the Lord has arrived. Because if it had arrived, that meant to them they'd missed the catching away, the parousia. He says that day, not the rapture, the day of the Lord will not take place till the man of sin be revealed. The man of sin is revealed in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. The apostasy and the man of sin be revealed. He's going to make a sudden appearance after the parousia. So what Paul is telling those, you haven't missed the catching away because what you're in is not the day of the Lord. So he says, stop being troubled. And I've given you all the other reasons here. Now you also have, I also have a, a whole bunch of other outlines. You have the kinsman redeemer, the goel. Uh, you have the tribes of Israel and the, and the seven trumpets we'll be looking at tonight. But first of all, this is the chart on the whole book of Revelation, okay, Uh, and the events that are taking place. The rapture begins the time, the parousia. It begins the seven-year period. In the first three and a half years, you have the first six seals. In the last three and a half years, you have seven trumpets and seven bowls of the judgment of God. And the Bible puts this three and a half years in different language, in Daniel and in Revelation. It's called a time, times and a half a time, which is three and a half years. It's called 1,260 days. It's called 42 months, exactly three and a half years. And you'll find it in Daniel and Revelation talking about the same thing. You cannot understand Revelation without Daniel. You can't understand Daniel without Revelation. And as I've been saying all over the world for many years, Old Testament prophecy is like a skyrocket. They're not concerned about the time between events. They see the first coming and the second coming of Jesus in the same sentence. They see that. Uh, And actually the example I, uh, the main example I used was when Jesus went into the synagogue at Capernaum. I can read about this in Luke chapter 4. He read from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to the heal of the sick and say, he stopped reading in the middle of a sentence. And he said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. What does the rest of the certain, what does the rest of the sentence say? And the day of vengeance of our God. That's still future. There's been 2,000 years at a comma in Isaiah 61. 2,000 years. The prophets did not see time gaps. And that's why people get all confused about prophecy. They didn't see time gaps. It's like a skyrocket going off. And they always didn't see what came first and what came second. The book of Revelation puts it in order for us. 
That's chapter 66 of God's story. It sums up everything else, how God is going to sum up everything in Jesus Christ. Without the book of Revelation, we wouldn't know what to do with all these things. So that's why my emphasis is always on the book of Revelation and how everything else fits into it. Daniel and Matthew and 1 Thessalonians and everything else. Okay, so you have the first two months. And then you have the second, the second coming. But by the way, the second coming is not a biblical phrase. You cannot find the phrase, the second coming of Christ in the Bible. It says, unto them that look for him will he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. But the phrase, the second coming, is not there. Okay, that's, that's a man-made statement. However, he comes back as king of kings and lord of lords at the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19. Following that, you have the thousand-year millennium. You have the battle of Gog and Magog, which is not the same Gog and Magog of Ezekiel. It's a different time in history. And then you have eternally the new heavens and the new earth. You have the great white throne judgment and the lake of fiery following uh, that actually follows the millennium, the thousand-year reign of peace. That's when the ungodly are resurrected. And at the middle of the seven years, there are several things happen. Number one, the seven-sealed scroll that we talked about, the mortgage deed of redemption is open. And our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, has opened it. The Antichrist will be assassinated. And the Greek text is very plain. The wound of his death. It's exactly the same phrase of Jesus as a lamb had been slain. Exactly the same phrase used earlier in the book of Revelation. The word and the phrase means to die by violence. Later on it says people worship the Antichrist. It indicates in, Re- in Revelation 13, and we'll look at it, that the world worships the beast that had the wound of his death and yet did live. live. He had the death wound and yet did live. And again, Second Thessalonians says God's going to send strong delusion to believe the lie. The devil can't raise anybody from the dead, folks. Only God can do that. The two witnesses will be killed. The 144,000 of Israel are sealed. We looked at that last week. The abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist puts his image in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem and demands that he be worshipped as God. That will be set up in the middle of the tribulation after he's resurrected. What's the one lesson the Jews have learned in 4,000 years of history? God hates what? Idols, worse than anything. And uh, And then in Revelation 7, there's a multitude in white raiment that are standing before the throne of God And it says, these are those continuously coming out of the great tribulation. It is not an event. It's a continuous action participle in the Greek text. So those that are continuously coming out of the great tribulation. There will be people saved all during the great tribulation. How many of your friends have you witnessed to that have never accepted Jesus? You have friends like that? Let me see your hands. Don't you think they're going to understand what happens when you're all caught up? (laughs) You've been talking about it. And contrary to the film, it's not secret. We're not going to be sitting here and all of a sudden Brother Outlaw is going to be disappeared, just become invisible. That was started by a man by the name Pierre Giraud in the 15th century. That is not true. It says we're going to be caught up. It doesn't say we're going to be turned invisible. Jesus was caught up visibly. In Revelation 11, the two witnesses are caught up visibly. And you and I are going to be caught up to meet the Lord. And that's going to be one of the noisiest events in the history of the world. Nothing in the Bible says it's secret. It doesn't say we're going to be invisible people. It doesn't say that. He's, we're going to have body. Just to think, my, you know, my wife's body, I laid in the groom. I in the grave here last July. That's going to come out of the grave as a body, not as a spirit. Her spirit's coming back with Jesus to join the resurrected body. I don't know about you, but when I get on a roller coaster, I go, woo! Imagine what's going to happen when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And many of you know from my 80th birthday, I jumped off a tower 630 feet high, and I've got acrophobia. And I was on my way to Fiji to teach, and I went through New Zealand. The only thing to do, the tallest structure south of the equator, you get to jump off it and free fall. And I can't get on a ladder without getting dizzy. And my kids didn't think I'd do it, so I had to show them I would. But I want you to know, when I was falling at 55 miles an hour, I was not invisible. I was going, ah! <laughs> Howling my silly head off. <laughs> so what's it going to be when suddenly, whoo, we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air? Wow. <laughs> wow. And so all that goes on during the middle of the tribulation. And, uh, and all the times in Revelation and Daniel that are given us, the times, time and a half, and 1,260 days or 42 months, all have to do with the last three and a half years of the tribulation. 
And again, the temple has to be built by the middle of the tribulation, not before the rapture. Not before the rapture. So that brings us to the seven trumpets. The sounding of the seven trumpets. Okay, Revelation. I know we're going through this fast. (laughs) But uh, we've got 12 weeks to go through it. And again, in the college classroom, I have 45 hours. Okay, Revelation chapter 8. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. You know what I tell my good pastor? <laughs> what I tell my good pastor friends who are non Pentecostal and noisy like us? I say, that's for you. The rest of eternity is for us. <laughs> but you see, you got to get the picture here. They don't know what's inside the seven seal book. Suppose you had an uncle that was worth millions and you heard you were mentioned in his will. And you get in the attorney's office and he opens the paper and you go, <clears throat> need some water. I better answer the phone. Come on, come on, come on. That's, that's what's saying here. Space, it, it as a half hour. Does it doesn't seem like, God, come on, tell me I want to know what's in the book. I want to know what it says. So now the book is open. I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, again, this is not the trumpet of God. These are the trumpets of angels. And what they're doing, they're heralding the opening of the seven sealed book. You know, when a king would send a document into town, the trumpeter would come, they gather the people, then they tell what was in the document. Well, here's the seven trumpeters announcing the opening of the seven sealed book. Now, maybe we'll find out what's in it. Now, we don't find out yet, because he's got some other things to say. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel, now remember, the word angel simply means messenger. In the Old Testament, the last book of the Bible, Malachi means my messenger. And Malach can mean an angel or any kind of a human messenger. The context determines who it is. In the New Testament, the Greek word is angelos, that we get our word angel from. And yet Paul calls Timothy his angelos, his messenger. So many times, many of these, these are pictures of Jesus. So let's see what's going on here. Another angel came out and stood at the altar having the golden censer. Who is the only person, Alan, don't you answer this, in the Old Testament, Alan, and Alan has a degree in biblical languages, okay? He has a master's degree in biblical languages. Uh, when I taught Greek, he substituted for me. So, okay. Now, who, who's the only one in the, in the Bible that could handle the golden censer. The high priest. The high priest. So he's showing Jesus as the high priest. Now let me do an excursion into the book of Hebrews. If you have, the, if you have your Bibles, open to the book of Hebrews. Okay. And we're going to start with chapter 7 when we get there. Now yeah. I was going to skip over this, but the Lord said no today. I was sitting at the dining room table. I didn't get out of the house today till it was time to come here. Okay, I was sitting at the dining room table, and I said, Lord, I haven't got time to get into this. He says, what do you mean you don't have time? Now, that's about as plain as you can get. That's about as plain as you can get. Now, I have had the Lord tell me to shut up. And when I started to talk again, he said, what part of shut up don't you understand? <laughs> And that story was when we were witnessing to a couple in Australia that knew nothing about Jesus for four hours. Four hours. We were at the Great Barrier Reef. I'm part fish. So my wife and the lady talked for the three hours while her husband and I sang. And and, and, and then we had another two-hour boat trip. Every time I wanted to say, do you want to accept Jesus? God said, shut up. I started again. What part of shut up don't you understand, George? So we get home. I've told you before, my wife would get a name and pray for them before we'd meet them. When we get home, my, the Lord spoke to my wife to check her diary 10 months before we met this couple. In the middle of the night in Kansas City, she'd written this lady's name down and prayed for her. And she never looked at the clock and wrote down the time, but she wrote down the exact time. So we send a letter back to Australia. We get a phone call. What does it say? That's the exact time. We've checked it out. We've compared. I had a head-on collision, and everybody was told I would not live. And because of that, they became Christians. She used to call and talk to my wife for three hours at a time from Australia. So I've learned when God says shut up to do what? 
Shut up. And when he says to not to, to, to talk about something, what am I supposed to do? Talk about it. Hebrews chapter 7. Now, the book of Hebrews, again, as the whole Bible is all about Jesus. All about Jesus. Starts out, God who in bits and pieces spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us in his Son, whom is appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his own power, when he had all by himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And what he is showing is Jesus is greater than the prophets. They had bits and pieces. He is the ultimate revelation of who God is. Secondly, he gives seven quotes how great angels are. But then he says, Jesus as God created the angels. So he is greater than the angels. And then he talks about Adam, how Adam brought death into the world. And how Jesus tasted death for every man and gives us life. And he's greater than Adam as the last Adam. Then he talks about Moses, how he was faithful over all the house of Israel. And then he reminds us, Jesus is God and he created the house of Israel. Then he talks about Joshua led them in but couldn't give them rest. And Jesus gives us rest from all our efforts. He's greater than Joshua. And then he talks about the many sacrifices of the Old Testament, time after time after time, and how every high priest had to make a sacrifice for their own sin. But he said, this man once for all entered into the Holy of Holies and made eternal redemption for us. And he gets to the end of that argument and says the sum of the argument is this, we have a great high priest who is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Praise God. You don't need any other priest. Now, Hebrews chapter 7 talks about the priesthood. He ends chapter 6 by saying, We have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, that enters into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner for us has entered Jesus, made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek only appears two places in the Bible beside this. Okay, that's in the book of Genesis uh, chapter, my mind's blank, chapter 14 and the 110th Psalm. He comes on the scene. And what we're told here is Abraham, the patriarch, gave this man a tenth of everything. He paid tithe to Melchizedek. Don't let televangelists tell you that tithing was in the law. Abraham lived 450 years before the law. And he knew he ought to tithe. Jacob, one of the biggest crooks that ever lived, knew he ought to tithe. And he lived about 400 years before, okay, 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 way before the law was ever given. So it's got nothing to do with the law. It has to do with our relationship with God. And, 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 and I'll goes on to say, to whom also the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first by interpretation king of righteousness, that's the meaning of the word Melchizedek, and king of Shalom, which is king of peace. Now it says, without father, without mother, without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made a picture of the Son of God, remains a priest continuously. Now all he is saying in this, in order to be a priest, you had to have a family tree. Your father had to be a priest. You had to be from the tribe of Levi to be a priest under the law. So you had to produce a genealogy. You couldn't start your priesthood till you were 30 years old. And most of them had to quit when they were 55. Okay, there were exceptions. So under the law from the tribe of Judah, the kingly tribe could not be a priest. And some from the tribe of Levi could not be a king. And he goes on to say, if the law made everything perfect, why the need for another Melchizedek priest? Or now can you put up slide 96, please? Melchizedek appeared about 2000 B.C. All right, he was a high priest of God because of who he was. Now, I think it was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, simply because I don't think anyone else in history could be called the king of righteousness, okay? But he made appearance to Abraham. The law was given 1450 B.C. And the argument of Hebrews chapter 7 is this. If the law being administered by the Levitical priesthood made things perfect, why does the 110th Psalm written 400 years after the law about the coming Messiah, say you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, the law is 1450 B.C., Melchizedek appeared 2000 B.C., and yet 1000 B.C., the 110th Psalm, says you're going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, under, under the Old Testament law, there couldn't be a king priest. To be a king after David came, you had to be from the tribe of, I had to be a descendant of David. And to be a priest, you had to be from the tribe of Levi.
But what he says here in this chapter, and you'll have to read it at your convenience, God changed the law. He has the right to do that. And it says in verse 18, he has annulled the commandments. And he has changed the priesthood to a king priest, Jesus Christ. And by the way, the book of First Peter says you are all kings and priests unto God. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You should show forth the praises of him that's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it says here, because God has changed the priesthood and only the Levitical priest can administer the law, he has abolished the law. The Old Testament law was abolished at Calvary. That includes every part of it. And to give you another statement, I can't go into that, but just read the book of Galatians. He gives seven arguments to show the Galatians are not under the Old Testament law. Seven different arguments. The Galatians have been saved by faith. Someone came in and said, now you've got to keep the Old Testament law. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the Sabbath day. You've got to keep the feast days. Paul literally calls them, you dummy Galatians. And he uses the same word Socrates to call his students stupid. The same word. He said, how are you saved? By grace or keeping the law? What makes you think you're made perfect by keeping law? And he makes it clear that that law was removed in seven discussions just in the little book of Galatians. The first ten chapters of the book of Hebrews are all about that. It's written to Jewish Christians. In Colossians it says he took this certificate of indebtedness, which was the law. We're all guilty. Someone must need this tonight. Lord won't let me get away from it. Okay, what's the law for breaking any of the Ten Commandments? Death, okay, you're going to get stoned. And what it shows in the book of Colossians is the devil had me under his control. And he's waving God's law in his face. And it says, he says, George Westlake is guilty. He's broken all ten of these. All ten of them. So have you. Don't look at me like that. He's, okay, he's, okay, he's broken all ten of these. He shattered all ten of them. How many have ever told a little itsy bitsy lie? How many have ever told a big whopper? You better raise your hand if that's number two. You're a lawbreaker. Okay, how many have ever put yourself ahead of God once in your life? You're a lawbreaker. Okay, how many have ever stolen anything? Come on. You're a lawbreaker. Matter of fact, now that I got saved, I thought, well, what do I need to repent of my sins for? I haven't stolen too much. <laughs> no more than the other guys. Now, I grew up in Detroit, folks. <laughs> and uh, so, so he's got this certificate. George Westlake has broken all ten of these. You can't help him. But it says Jesus took that certificate of indebtedness and he nailed it to his cross. And he spoiled principalities and powers. You know what that means? He came along and he carried me off a of spoil and set me free because I've been set free from that law of condemnation. Sets us free by his grace. And that includes the Ten Commandments. Now, nine of the commandments are repeated for the Christian in the New Testament. The only one that's not is keeping the Sabbath day. That's not repeated for the Christian. That was strictly for Israel. You know, used to call me on the TV program, Brother Westlake, do we have to keep the Old Testament Sabbath or, the Jew or do we keep Sunday? I said, yes. We're not saved by what day we keep. We're saved by who we know. Do we have to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And I can give you all the arguments why I baptize that way or in the name of Jesus only. I'd say yes. We're not saved by a baptismal formula. We're saved because of a relationship. He that has the Son has life, and he that doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. So a lot of Christians strain at gnats and swallow camels. I better not get into that. I'll be on that all night. We make majors out of minors. Majors out of minors. So he, he is our great high priest. And you notice what he does. Another angel came, stood at the altar having a golden censer. There was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. Who's the only one that can offer prayers on our behalf to God? There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I got news for you. Mary can't pray for you. St. Jude can't pray for you. St. Christopher can't pray for you. Only Jesus can pray for you. <laughs> you know, Mary said in the Magnificat, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior. She needed to be saved too. All right. Now he offered with the prayers of all the saints of the golden altar which was before the throne. The smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of their altar, threw it to the earth. There were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared to sound. Now, now, now angels announce a whole lot of things in the Bible, significant events. They announced to Abraham the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. They announced to Gideon, victory over the Midianites. They announced to Zechariah, the birth of John the Baptist. Gabriel did that. To Mary and Joseph, the birth of Jesus. To the shepherds, unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
There are those trying to say Jesus became the Christ as he became a man. Hey, he was born as Christ the Lord, we are told in the word of God. In Revelation 16, an angel announces the destruction of Babylon. And Gabriel announced to Daniel about the 77s that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And so the angels are there to do, uh, and they are to do what God told them to do. Now, the first angel sounded. Uh, Let me read another list I've got here, what angels do in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they they announce war. And there's there's war in the book of Revelation. They announce the gathering of the people. There's the gathering of the people in the book of Revelation. They proclaim the great festivals of God. There's a great festival of God. It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, proclaimed in the book of Revelation. The announcements of royalty. You are the Lamb's wife. You and I are part of that bride. Manifestations of the majesty and power of God are announced with a trumpet. The overthrow of the ungodly and the laying of the foundation of the temple. All those things are announced by the blowing of the trumpet in the Old Testament. So here are the seven trumpets. Number one. You know, they try to say that the rapture takes place after all of this and it's business as usual. Now, as you read the tribulation, ask yourself, is going to be business as usual? All the things that are going to happen. Jesus said before the parousia, they'll be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. As, as in the days of Noah, they knew not till the flood came and took them all the way. So shall the parousia, the coming of the Son of Man be. Two in the bed, one taking the other left. Two grinding at the mill, one taking the other left. And he's talking about the event we call the rapture there. So I've already pointed out that Matthew is not concerned about chronology, only about events, and I told you why. All right, let's go on and read this now. Uh, Starting with verse 6. The first angel sounded, there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Cast upon the earth, a third part of the trees was burned up and all the grass. The, The second angel sounded, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. The third part became blood. Third part of the creatures that were in the sea and had life died. The third part of the ships were destroyed. Third angel sounded the, I'm sorry, the third angel sounded there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. It fell in the third part of the rivers on the fountains of water. That's the drinking water. And the name of the star was called Abacinth, and Abacinth because many men died because the waters were poisoned. Abacinth is a bitter poison, by the way. And the fourth angel sounded, the third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon, the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, the day did not shine for the third part of it, and the night likewise. And I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying, and I like this, whoa, 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 it's, oui, oui, oui. <laughs> That's the Greek text. Oui, oui. That's enough to scare you to death. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet, of the three angels which are about to sound. Now the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star which had fallen from heaven. Now we're told in the book of Revelation, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Who, what angel has fallen from heaven? Satan. All the way through the Bible, we're told he was cast out of heaven. Jesus said, I beheld Satan falling out of heaven. He said, as lightning shines from the east to the west. Isaiah chapter 14 indicates he would be cast out. Okay? I saw a star which had fallen from heaven. Had fallen. And I know know the King James Bible says, uh, it goes on to say, say, I saw a star fall. That's not what the Greek text says. Greek perfect tense, completed action. I saw a star which had fallen from heaven, and to him was given the key of the abyss. Now, who is the owners of the keys of death and of Hades? Jesus. Jesus. We saw that in Revelation chapter 1. He is the possessor of the keys. He has to give this person the key. And he uses the word him, okay, to make it clear it is a person, one that had fallen from heaven. Jesus is the only one. It says, he opens and no man shuts. He shuts and no man opens. Now, what in the world is the abyss? Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And Luke is the only one that records this. No, that's not the chapter I wanted. I'm sorry. Chapter 8 is what I want, I think. Mm -hmm. 
My mind has gone blank. Where is the... Page 31. No. Page 31. No. That doesn't happen very often, but... Oh, yeah, it's okay, chapter 8. Thank you, Paula. Uh, verse 26. He arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And he went, forth to, he went forth to land to meet him out of the city a certain man, which had demons a long time. He wore no clothes, neither did he live in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with Jesus, you Son of God, Most High? I beseech you, torment me not. Actually, the Greek text says he bowed low. It's not even a contest when... I am between the devil and God. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and feeders, and broke the bonds, were driven of the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what's your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons were entered into him. Now, we don't know how many, but a Roman legion was 6,000. They brought him that he would not, he besought him, they besought the demons, that he, they would not command them to go into the abyss. This is the only place this is recorded in this story. Okay, they said, let us go into the pigs. Now, as you read this story and compare it with Revelation, what we're going to read, there are demons incarcerated in the abyss. Jesus allowed these to go into the hogs. Why? They were selling pork to the Jews, and they were still under the law, and that was contrary to the law. So he allowed their business to be damaged. And I like what they said after. Here they were delivered from this huge problem, and they said, they want Jesus to leave. Get out of here. We don't, we don't want you here. But we can tame that man. We can't tame Jesus. All right? But, but we, don't, we don't want you. In other words, Lord, deliver me from my trouble, but let me keep my pigs. I wonder how many people that happens to. God, I'm saved, but I, I got this pig I want to hang on to. You can mess with my life, but don't mess with this now. Don't mess with this. I, uh, I've been, uh, huh? Yeah. So, now what are these demons that are let loose going to do? The demons, and I heard an evangelist years ago, well, the reason they went into the hogs was demons can't, or hogs can't swim, so all the demons died. Demons are spirits. They don't have to swim. You know, they're spirits. You got to read the book, folks. You got to read the book. What else fails? Read the book. And when all else fails, read the book. Okay? Now, uh, let's go on and read this. Uh, he opened the abyss. There rose smoke out of the great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. There came up out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and under them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. It was commanded them they should not hurt the grass nor the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And the only ones we read about being sealed are the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And to them it was given they should not kill them, they should be tormented five months. So this plague lasts five months during the great tribulation period. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. In those days shall men seek death, shall not find it, shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Imagine trying to kill yourself and you can't die. God will take death from the earth for five months. People will be living in torment. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared to battle. Now some people see tanks here. Tanks and guns don't, they don't wound people for five months. They kill people. And this is like the, and actually this is like the bite of a scorpion. They had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth as the teeth of lions. And there's amazing, in some of the books you can see, a, I can actually see a locust that looks like this. You can actually see one. But these, this is a demonic horde, because Luke explains it. Don't send us into the abyss. The abyss is open, and they all come out. All right? And they had breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings is the sound of chariots, many horses running to battle. They had tails like unto scorpions. There were stings in their tails. They had power to hurt men five months. They had a king over them, which is the messenger angel of the bottomless pit of the abyss. His name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue it's Apollyon, destruction and destroyer. And one woe is past, and there come two more woes hereafter. You think it's going to be business as usual during this five months? <laughs> and, and this is only, only the trumpets, not the bowls of the wrath of God. 
All right, start with the next one. Verse 13, and the sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four living ones of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now, they're obviously fallen angels or they wouldn't be bound in the Euphrates. The Euphrates in prophecy is the dividing line between east and west. The ten-nation confederacy that we're going to be reading about of the Antichrist in the next couple of weeks is actually Western civilization. Ten nations in Western civilization, and I'll tell you why I say that when we get there. The, the kings of the east don't come into it till after the middle of the tribulation. It's almost like they're being ignored and left out of what's going on. Now, you know the big thing arising on the horizon now is China. And they are also a threat to Russia. Don't misunderstand that. They're as much a threat to Russia are they, as they are the United States, even though they're both communistic. It's the economy of the world that makes it spin. And they're as big a threat to the Russian economy as they are to the United States economy. And by the way, the only thing that's keeping our economy going and the dollar high is because business corporations around the world choose to trade in American dollars. If that ever quits, your dollar won't be worth the paper it's written on. Okay? And we are living right there. Don't forget when the world leader comes on the scene, he has to be an economic genius. He has to solve the political problems and the military problems of the world. And we'll see how he does that when we get to the other chapters of Revelation and Daniel. So uh, he's coming on the scene now. He says, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Four angels were loose which prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year to kill the third part of men. Now, we saw under the fourth rider on the horse that one quarter of the earth's population was killed. Here is a third of those that are left killed. Business as usual. All right. And, and they were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. That doesn't mean it'll go on for a whole year and a whole month and a whole day. No, no. It means there's a particular day that God has picked out. A particular hour on a particular day in a particular month in a particular day, it's already a sign this army is going to move. Amen. All right? It's in God's time. And what were they there? To kill the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200 million. What nation on earth can field an army of 200 million men? China. It's the only one. It's the only one. And the book of Revelation is going to talk about the kings of the east being prepared. So this will move actually against the Antichrist. Now, now let me show you a passage of scripture in Daniel chapter 11 while we're here. Are you all thinking? Okay, Daniel chapter 11. I hope you're reading Daniel along with Revelation. Daniel chapter 11. Okay, he's talking... In Daniel chapter 11, there are over 130 prophecies that were fulfilled between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But, there are, but, but at a point, it moves into the future. When you get to verse 35. In the middle of verse 35, it says, Even till the time of the end, because it's yet for a time appointed. The king shall do according to his will. We'll be reading this again later. He shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god. He shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that which is determined shall be done. He will not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. That phrase does not mean it's homosexual. I'll explain it when we get there later. Nor regard any God, for he will magnify himself above all. In his estate he will honor the God of forces or fortresses, a God whom his fathers knew not. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. He shall do in the strongholds of the strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. He shall cause him to rule over many, shall divide the land for game. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall push against him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter into the glorious land. Many countries shall be overthrown. And remember this verse. But these shall escape out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. That's the only country that the Antichrist will not rule. He will stretch forth his hand upon the countries. The land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold, of silver, over all the precious things of Egypt, over the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be in his steps. Tidings out of the east and from the north shall trouble him. 
Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly take away many. Tidings out of the north and out of the east, all right? So there is going out of the east and out of the south. Now this is where the kings of the... This, that Bible's too heavy for that stand. <laughs> now this is where the kings of the east come in. They move against the Antichrist and they lose. They lose. Because you're going to see that the devil gives this man his power and his throne and great authority. And God's sending strong delusion to believe the lie. Now why does it say the east and the south? Hey, have you noticed in the Bible that every enemy comes from the south? Because when the Old Testament prophecy was written, there was no way any... And actually, any enemy coming against Jerusalem from the east would go up around the Sea of Galilee rather than try to get through the River Jordan to get to them. So all the attacks on Jerusalem by Assyria and also from Babylon, which are east, came from the south. They came to the Sea of Galilee, they went up around, and they came down from the east up against Jerusalem. And so it always mentions the east and the south. And so the king of the south... However, when it says the king of the south by itself, it's Egypt. When it says the king of the north, it's Syria. And we'll talk about that, how they fight with Israel against the Antichrist. So we're living in times, folks, when these things are shaping up. And I'm, I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited. Now, why does God let loose an army that will kill one-third of the earth's population? Here's the things that he says. Uh, uh, let's, read, uh, let's read verse 17. I saw the horses in the vision. Then they said on them, having breastplates of fire and jasons and brimstone, the heads of the horses were as heads of iron, out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these things was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone that issued out of their mouth. Their powers in their mouth and their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and their heads with them do hurt. The rest of the men which were not killed of these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should worship demons. Demon worship and the occult is on the increase. All right? Is going to keep going up and up and up. And during the tribulation, it says they're going to worship the dragon that gives power to the man. The dragon, which is Satan. And there's a lot of things connected with the occult that people don't necessarily occult. I uh, don't necessarily connect. I want to read a passage from Isaiah 47. You know, people say, uh, what's your sign? Uh, you know, are you a Leo? Are you a Hootenanny? Or what are you? I say, I'm a Christian. They say, what sign were you born under? January 28th, 1951. I was born again under the sign of the cross. All right? And you see all this garbage on the internet. Well, Leo's act a certain way and Virgo's act a certain way. That is pure nonsense. And let me tell you where it started. Babylon is man's organized rebellion under Satan against God. And we're going to talk about that. And it started in Babylon. Read Isaiah 47. And this is written before the Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar. All right. Stand now with your enchantments, with the multitude of your sorceries, wherein you've labored from your youth, if it be that you shall prevail and may be able to profit. Your word with the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from things, these things that shall be upon you. They shall be as stubble. The fire will burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before. Thus shall there be unto those with whom you've labored, even the merchants from your youth. They shall wander every one to his quarter, and none shall save you. This is where the horoscope started in Babylon. Again, I'll be explaining when we get to chapter 13. Babylon is man's organized rebellion under Satan against God. And those kind of things are nothing but superstition. And you don't need superstition when you know Jesus. All right? Amen. A lot of Christians are superstitious. I had a friend that put his Bible on his seat so he wouldn't have an accident. Okay. It's not the Bible on your seat. It's the Spirit of God that protects you. We don't have, we don't have good luck charms. And every once in a while someone says to me, good luck. I don't respond because I know people mean well. I don't, I don't believe Christians have luck. I don't believe in luck for Christians. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And God does things for us. You know what I was thinking the last couple of weeks? Why would this 13 acres next door to us here, why would that be a sanitary landfill in the middle of the city for all these years? 
That's where our educational building sits. That's where the parking lot sits. Why would that be there? Because God knew millions of years ago we were going to need that property before we could build this church to keep reaching people. And if you know the story, they wanted $550,000 for it. I offered them 25000 They laughed at me. We got that 13 acres for $5,000. That's what God does. We got the vicar station across the street. They said they wouldn't sell and started getting robbed every week. And they called me and said, we'll sell it, but we'll have to have what we had in it. And this was before we built the gym. We had to have that to build the gym in 85. And before we built that, because we were out of room in a little church on the corner, and they said, but we have to have what we have in it. We heard they had 250000 in it. We didn't have any money. They came back the next week and said, how does 25000 sound? That's what God does for you. If God tells you to do something, get out of the boat and let God do it for you. Out of the boat. Demon worship. Idol worship. God hates idols. Now, we can make an idol of our job. We can make an idol of our car. Anything we put ahead of God is an idol. Anything ahead of God. Nothing goes ahead of God. God has to be first. All right? Anything. Murder. Unborn babies. All right? If that's in the past, God forgives the past. It's under the blood. Leave it there. Don't let the enemy bring condemnation. Drugging. The Greek word is pharmakia. The translated witchcraft in your Bible. Pharmakia is the word we get our word pharmacy from. It means plain, old-fashioned drugging. Now, I was the chairman of the board of Teen Challenge Training Center for several years. Every person on hard drugs started out with weed, every single one. Right. Not going to hurt a little bit. All Take right. a puff. Right. Not going to mind. Everybody's doing it. It's okay. It's even legal in some states now. It's not legal with God. All right? All right? And they've proven over and over and over it damages you physically. But he uses pharmacia. They won't repent of their drugging. You talk about the people delivered from the drug, drug culture in this church. I'll guarantee you 99% of them started on weed. Every single one. And you give the devil a thumbnail, he'll grab your hand. You give him your hand, he'll take your arm. If you give him your arm, he'll pull you in. And so we need to understand that. Fornication. Any kind of sex except between a man and a woman in marriage is fornication. It's the Greek word pornea that we get our word pornography from. And they can scream all they want and say they were born that way. They were not born that way. Every study has proven it is a learned behavior like everything else. But let me tell you, we all need to be delivered from something. One sin isn't any worse than any other. How many know that you need to be delivered from something too? And so we're to treat everybody. We've always said for years, we are not a social club. We're a hospital for hurting people. We don't care where you've been. We don't care about your lifestyle. You're welcome to worship here. And we want you to know that Jesus Christ can set you free if you want to be set free. Pornea is the Greek word. Stealing. Stealing. Am I robbing God? Ooh. 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 10 says, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when she, he'll begin to sound, the mystery of God will be finished. Now, he doesn't sound until chapter 11, verse 15. So the seventh angel will be, are you all still here? Are you thinking? Are you reading Revelation and Daniel? Okay, read them, because we'll be in Daniel probably next week or the week after. I hate clocks. You know I do, after all. <laughs> After 42 years here, they know that I, that I know the devil created clocks and that all church PA systems are demon-possessed. <laughs> okay, let me turn over here, get back to my place. Chapter 10. Now, I, I, I briefly referred to this a, a week ago when we talked about Jesus as our kinsman redeemer. Remember, what God has in his hand in chapter 5 is the mortgage deed. And Jeremiah 32 explains that perfectly. Written on the inside and on the back side, the scroll sealed up and sealed with seven seals. John's caught up into heaven. Revelation chapter 5, he sees God with this seven-sealed book. On the inside is what has to happen to give man back his inheritance. On the outside is only one name, the name of man's nearest relative. This is according to Levitical law. I mortgage my house at the bank. The only one that can look at my mortgage deed is my nearest relative, my go ale, my kinsman redeemer, whose name is on the outside. And in chapter 4, John sees this in God's hand, and John says, I wept much. 
because no man in heaven or earth was found worthy to take the book and to loose the seals thereof. Why did John weep? He was in the spirit with his Jewish background. He knew what this was. He knew that until someone could open this book that sin and death and crime and sorrow would continue and Satan would continue to be like a roaring lion and the God of this world. And he starts crying and he hears a voice say, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root and offspring of David, has prevailed to take the book and to loose the seals thereof. And I turned and I saw a lamb as it had been slain, having seven eyes and seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God. And he walks over and takes the book out of the Father's hand and he starts to open it. And you hear the great praise, you've redeemed us by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. You're worthy of all praise and honor and glory and every created thing and myriads of myriad angels. Praise God. And he starts opening the book. Well, here in chapter 10, he's going to put one foot on the sea, one foot on the dry land. And as our nearest relatives swear by God that lives forever and ever, I'm taking it back. No more time for sin. No more time for death. No more time for sorrow. Hallelujah! We win! Praise God. So let's read it. After chapter 10, it's what's in the seven sealed book is the rest of Revelation. I saw another mighty angel come down with a heaven, clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was on his head. Who alone has the rainbow on his head? Jesus. His face was as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. This goes back to Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 1. He had in his hand a little book open. Now when you figure the side of the angel putting one foot on the sea, one foot on the dry land. Okay. Cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. Said the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to take the book. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things that the seven thunders uttered and write them now. How many want to know what the seven thunders said? You're going to have to wait till you get to heaven. Nobody knows, neither do I. <laughs> so if someone says, thus says the Lord, the seven thunders of this, they're lying. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Now remember, he's talking as our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. Swear by him that lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that therein are, the sea and the things that therein are, there should be time no longer. In other words, there's no more time, devil. No more time for sin and crime and sorrow. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God will be finished, which he declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, said, Go take the little book which is in your hand. And the angel stand above the sea of the earth. Go, the angel said, Give me the little book. And he said unto him, Take it and eat it up. It will be in your belly bitter, but in your mouth as sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. It was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said, you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now, Ezekiel did the same thing in Ezekiel 3 and 4. God said, take the book and eat it up. And it was exactly the same thing. He meant that Ezekiel was to get the message out. He was to understand it. And he was to get the message out to other people. Now, now the, uh, John was not released from Patmos. Okay, there was a bunch of tradition trying to say he was. But how did he preach to many people and nations? Through his book through the book of Revelation, through the gospel of John, through his first three letters. He's preached to every Christian that has ever lived since. And so, but he took the book because, you know, now, I know how many are happy the Lord's coming? Say amen. amen. But we're not going to rejoice seeing the ungodly punished. Amen. You know, I, was, I heard a preacher preaching one time when I was in Bible college. He said, the ungodly are going to hell. Praise the Lord. God doesn't say praise the Lord. God wants everybody saved. He wants everybody saved. He wants them to repent. He loves every person. He doesn't want them to end up in hell. The Bible says judgment is God's strange act. He doesn't like to do it, but he still does it. How many of you love it when you spank your kids? But how many do it because they need it? Okay. Judgment is God's strange act. As a matter of fact, if you listen to Pastor George, he acted like we killed him when he was young. <laughs> You know better because he grew up in this church. You know better. But uh, he, uh, he kind of gives that impression. <laughs> but uh, and I hollered one day when he said, my mother would spank me for this. And my dad come home and spank me. And I hollered out, but it worked. <laughs> it worked. Well, now, social workers say you can't spank your kids. Educated beyond their intelligence. 
God has provided a place on the anatomy to use that book of child, child psychology as a board of education. All right? The Bible says if you don't spank your son, you don't love him. Read the book of Proverbs. I've had more than parent one more, more than one parent tell me over the years. We don't believe in spanking. I almost said I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell. You better take authority now, or what, later on they'll take authority over you. And the next authority they'll be, uh, they'll want to put down is the teacher, and the one after that the policeman. All right. And that's that's what works, and they end up in the penitentiary. And on the other hand, you can be too strict. Too strict. The Bible said, don't provoke your children to wrath. Amen. And just let me give you a story. I told the family years ago, you won't know who they are, it was so many years ago. They had two daughters. And I went to the mom and dad, I said, you're so strict with those girls, I'll guarantee you, as soon as they get to be in their mid-teenage years, they're going to run off. And each of them did. Amen. Each of them did. You need to be strict biblically. And your kids need to know you love them no matter what. That, that love is unconditional, but we have rules. And you heard Pastor George say last Sunday, when I, I wasn't here this Sunday, I was preaching somewhere else, but the Sunday before, I, I, had to be, I was told as long as I lived in that house, I would be in church. And we told all four of our children that as long as you're living in this house, I don't care if you're 50 years old, you will be in church on Sunday morning. So you can make the decision. It's about time parents became parents and did what God told them to do and take responsibility for their children. Don't forget, God created us. He knows what we're made out of. So John eats the book, and it's going to be bitter. We don't want to see people cast into hell. We don't want to see people end up there instead of with Jesus Christ. We're not going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice because of what we have. But we're not going to be happy when we see all that happen. I hate it when I see someone is judged now. I thought, God, why couldn't we reach them before with the good news of Jesus Christ? Believe it or not, God wants everybody in ISIS saved too. He wants everybody saved. He wants the Muslims saved. I go to Muslim countries, as you know. And God wants everyone saved. There are Muslims having dreams of Jesus in Asia, walking into churches, say, I dreamt about Jesus last night. Tell me about him. God is not willing that one soul should perish. So we need to pray. We just need to pray that God will move. He doesn't want any of your relatives to perish. He doesn't want anybody from my family to perish. He wants them all saved. And mom and dad, whether you're young or old, you need to lead the way. Amen. I mentioned when I was preaching last Sunday in another church that example is not telling your children. Example, training a child up is showing them. Amen. Taking them by the hand and saying, come on, this is what it means to serve God, and we're going to serve God together. Amen. You take them by the hand, and when they're old, they'll not depart from Amen. that way. Take them and show them what it means to serve God. I'm out of time. The monster on the wall says I'm out of time. So we'll have time for questions before the, uh, before the 12 weeks are over. The 14th Wednesday is when I go to Burma. So let's pray. Father, we're thankful again for your love and your amazing grace. Thankful that we're saved by grace. We can't earn salvation. We don't deserve salvation. Your son paid the bill for our sin. And I pray if there's anyone here tonight doesn't know your son, speak to their hearts. I wonder as every head is bowed and every eye closed, do you know Jesus? I'm not asking you want to join Sheffield. We're not the way to heaven. The Bible says as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. The Bible says he that has the son has life. And he that doesn't have the son does not have life. The Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. We're children of God. What does that mean? We know whether we're saved. If you're saved, you know it. The Holy Spirit bears witness down deep inside. You know you're saved. And if you're not saved, God paid the bill for your sin. The message of the Bible is all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. In other words, God just butt out, leave me alone. I want to run my own life. And God calls that sin. Being holy, he has to punish that sin. He can't pretend we didn't do it. Can't pretend I didn't live that way. You didn't live that way. But he loves us so much. God who has always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At a point in time, God the Son became Jesus of Nazareth. He didn't stop being God. 100% God, 100% man. But he was born as a man so he could die. Lived without sin for 33 years. And God took all of your sin and all of my sin and put on him and judged him in our place. That's what the cross is all about. Your sin bill was paid because God loves you that much. And if you'd have been the only one that sinned, he'd have paid it just for you. 
So that means when you receive Jesus Christ, God forgives and forgets every sin you've ever committed. And he comes into your life and gives you a power of the Holy Spirit to live for him. So maybe you're here tonight, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. I need Jesus Christ. Please pray for me. Just slip your hand up and down. We're not asking you to join a church. God bless you. How many others? I need Jesus Christ in my life. I need Jesus Christ in my life. God bless you tonight. Would you stand with me, please, and give me about one more minute. Can we have some altar workers, please? Okay, we need a couple ladies, too. If you need Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to do what I did when I was 19 years old, baptized church member. I stepped out of my seat that night, and a man led me in a prayer, and Jesus Christ changed my life. He'll do that for you tonight. He hung stark naked. Don't misunderstand the cross. On the edge of a highway, not on a high hill. So people walking by could make fun of him. Suffering the judgment of God for your sin and mine. Publicly. Mocked and made fun of. And all he asks is you to step out and be prayed for. If you want eternal life. And to make a commitment of your life to him. So if you need Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to step out and make your way down here and let someone pray with you. Jesus Christ will set you free tonight. Again, you're not joining this church. We're not the way to heaven. I'm going to ask each of you to turn to the person next to you. Say, if you want to go down and pray, I'll go with you. Go ahead. That's how I got saved when I was 19. The man next to me said, if you want to go down and pray, I'll go with you. I never preach anywhere in the world without giving an invitation to receive Jesus Christ. I went to church every Sunday after I was born. My parents took me. Never knew I could know Jesus personally until I was 19. He'll change your life tonight. Okay, I'm going to have you repeat after me, and then, uh, and then this will be our benediction. They'll stay up here if you want someone to pray with you. Repeat after me. God loves me, God loves me. as if I'm the only person he ever had to love. I am as important to God as any person who has ever lived. And if I'd have been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have died for me. Praise God. That's the benediction. Bring someone with you to church Sunday. God bless you. Okay, Brother Husky, God Thank bless you. you. Thank you. I did all I could not to run. <laughs> bless you, brother. Thank you.